This week, our government introduced our first budget, an ambitious, long-term plan for growth. A budget that allows our country to take an essential step to strengthen the middle class and revitalize our economy. Justin Trudeau defends his budget, but how long will Canadians accept big deficits if the economy fails to flourish? Welcome to our abbreviated Easter Sunday Scrum. This week's panelists, freelance columnist Susan Riley and the Ottawa Citizen's Katie O'Malley. Good morning, ladies. Thanks for joining us. Susan, uh, what were your initial thoughts on this budget when it was revealed this week? I thought it was quite daring. I thought it was quite astonishing, actually, how a lot of the, the shibboleths and the, the things that we've been led to believe over the last 10 years and we all we willingly believed um, were just kind of blown up in this budget, you know? You can't have huge deficits is one of them. Uh, there's no, You can't get rid of any of those... Um, little tax, boutique tax credits for families, the fitness tax, yeah, because, you know, there'll be rebellion. Um, a lot of things happened in that budget or are, were announced, are going, about to happen, uh, that we're not supposed to, we're supposed to be out beyond the pale. And uh, so I thought it was quite a daring budget. Mm -hmm. And $29 billion deficits uh, for the first year, the same amount next year, Katie. Do you think Canadians will accept that kind of debt? Well, I think that that was the more surprising part of the budget. I mean, to be clear, many of the things that were in this budget, uh, particularly to do with spending and to do with sort of restructuring the, uh, the tax system and these credits, all of that was in the Liberal campaign platform. None of this should have been a huge shock. The deficit number, on the other hand, was considerably more sizable than they had initially uh, sort of speculated. Now, They've been leading up to this for the last couple of months. We've been hearing sort of the uh, the tut tutting and the muttering about the you know books not being nearly as in good shape as was suggested, which is of course a great debate with the Conservatives over whether or not they were left in surplus or not. Um, but in general, I think that that was a number that could give people who were even maybe okay with like a, a ten or fifteen billion dollar deficit might raise their eyebrows a little when it gets close to the 30 mark. Um, that said, I think that the trick for the Liberals is going to be demonstrating that the money that's being spent is going to worthwhile things. What the, the, the curse is, it's not even the big things. It's the $18 orange juice. It's the thought that ministers and politicians are spending taxpayer dollars on things that are actually just sort of fripperies. And I think that that's what the Liberals have to guard against. If it looks like all of this money, more than expected perhaps, is, is going into, you know, into better bridges, uh, bringing back the court challenges program, stuff like that, I think they'll probably have more leeway with the public. But if it looks like it's just being poured into sort of patronage uh, uh, projects and that sort of thing, that becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's hear what uh, Conservative leader Rona Ambrose had to say about this budget. From a taxpayer's point of view, this budget is a nightmare scenario. We have the Liberals borrowing way beyond the $10 billion deficit promise. We have no plan to create the jobs that we need in Canada right now. And we have taxes going up. Susan, what do you make of that criticism? I think it'll just wash over people and people won't listen. That That's a reaction that was pro could have been scripted by Stephen Harper. And that was developed delivered in, a, you know, a lot less hysterical a tone by Rana Ambrose, who's who's very effective in her job. But um, I just don't think people are willing to listen to that kind of extreme rhetoric at this point. Um, I agree with Katie. There'll be a niggling concern about uh, this, the size of this deficit, but it's only going to get to be a nightmare scenario if we're talking about the same size of deficits four or five years down the road. I mean, I think the consensus is this is a new government. They've come in with an ambitious and very different plan for the country. There are a lot of beneficiaries, by the way, not senators, not cabinet ministers, students, you know, parents of young children. There are a lot of people who are going to benefit in small but significant ways from this budget. Uh, so I think her, uh, I think she risks irrelevancy by by using that kind of rhetoric. Okay, Katie, what do you think, uh, out of everything in the budget, what do you think will go over well with Canadians and what might not be so popular? Oh, well, I think as we, we've discussed, the notion of, uh, in a lot of cases, the changes to the tax system may reduce in probably not, depending on sort of what your income level is, what your family situation is, possibly paying slightly less taxes or getting slightly more back from, from the government. I think that those are the sorts of things, the, the, uh, the sort of concrete example that people will have. That's most likely to, people do tend to like it when their tax credits go up, and that is, you know, what the Liberals keep saying is going to happen for the vast majority of Canadians, or Canadian families, I should say. Um, also, income tax, there's been a, a change there that could start to be seen on paychecks, and if people start to think, huh, 
well, maybe I am paying a little less in taxes. Um, in terms, again, of the most, uh, the most difficult thing, it's going to be this notion of, is the money being spent responsibly? Because mm -hmm. I think that that's what Canadians are probably concerned about above and beyond the idea of deficits. It's, okay, let's forget the red and black for a moment here. Is the money, does it seem to be going to sensible projects? Is it being used wisely? Or is it just sort of a madhouse of throwing cash around in the air and, and dancing in it? Okay. And, and the, the latter could be a problem for the Liberals. If they look like they're, you know, using it wisely, I think people will probably cut them more slack. And just on, on uh, Rana Ambrose's comment, when I, when I saw the nightmare scenario, all I could think of is, you've got at least three more budgets with this government. Like, yeah. save something <laughs> for the next one. Is it going to be apocalyptic? Because if it's got to keep getting worse, then I feel like they kind of... They, they kind of maybe went a little further this time, not thinking that they're going to have to uh, worry about it in the future. Well, Susan, you brought up uh, the former prime minister. How do you think uh, Justin Trudeau compares in his selling of this budget? I have been struck by Justin Trudeau, not just in the selling of the budget, but since he's become prime minister, struck and surprised, I might say, uh, by how confident he, he is. And it's not um, a confidence that based in bluster, but uh, it's, it's almost a serenity. Um, I think he's doing daring things, as I said. Um, they're also taking their time on various things. They're not being rushed or stampeded um, into meeting all their promises all at once. I know I'm, I'm not meaning to sound like an advocate for this government. I'm just saying that it's a very different style, and, and it's quite striking. Now, his confidence is probably fed by the fact that up till now, he's, you know, Canadians have his back. I mean, he's still massively popular. Um, we'll see if it frays at all when things start to go south, as they inevitably will. Um, but for now, I've been really struck. And the fact that he would take his family, by the way, to Fogo Island, off the coast of Newfoundland, on Easter weekend, in the midst of everybody still talking about this huge budget, they all deserve their holidays, I guess. Um, but I thought that was interesting, too, an interesting choice of holiday, um, if you want to leave wintry, chilly Ottawa, which I think most of us do. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people would choose Arizona or Hawaii or someplace before they go there. So that was an interesting choice, too. Well, Fogo Island is quite beautiful. But when oh, you talk about his confidence, Katie, is it enough to actually boost confidence in the economy? What if the economy doesn't come back strong? Is this budget going to stand? I have to be one of those people who, uh, this, is, this feels like a shameful thing to admit, who doesn't actually think the government of the day, any government of the day, has that much control yeah, over what right. the economy does. <laughs> I, I think right. that confidence is always better than, you know, you know, terrified cowardice in, in terms of a prime minister. <laughs> but uh, I think the economy is large enough and is, is kind of uh, autonomous enough of government that I'm not super sure this budget's going to have a huge impact on it. I guess where we could see and what we should be watching if there's going to be kind of an external reaction that could uh, affect uh, uh, the economy, it would probably be currency. And it would probably be what kind of confidence does this raise amongst you know, both countries who want to invest or want to continue to invest in Canada, as well as kind of where, where the dollar goes. But again, I'm not totally sure in this day and age how much control any prime minister have or any government has over how that actually plays out. Uh, so I think that it almost becomes more of a, of a question of style and psychology than actual economic effect. Okay, another big story uh, that broke uh, this past week, actually on the same day as the budget, it was the passing of former Toronto Mayor Rob Ford, a polarizing politician uh, whose notoriety and governing style made him a household name far beyond Toronto's borders, really. Rob Ford garnered the kind of attention this country will not forget or likely ever see again, arguably. Susan, when you think back this, this last week after news of his passing, how do you remember those tumultuous times? I always sort of felt sorry for Rob Ford, to tell you the truth. Um, I know he was scandalous and he was sexist. I never believed he was racist, by the way. I think he had a complicated relationship with people of other races, but I, but I didn't see him as racist. If anything, it's almost like he wanted to be uh, another race rather than... Anyway. Um, yeah, so I, it's hard to it's hard to measure. I mean, if he was healthy, well, and making another run for the mayoralty of Toronto, I would probably be saying, "Whoa, you know, please let's not elect this guy again." Um, but given his tragic end, um, yeah, I felt sort of sorry for him. Yeah, Katie, do you think we'll ever see anyone like Rob Ford again in the political sphere in Canada, or or, or will there be a legacy? 
Um, I think that in terms of exactly like Rob Ford, it, it seems unlikely, although I don't think anyone would have predicted Rob Ford would become such a, a sort of compelling force uh, and figure across the country, for better or for worse. In terms, I do think that we are going to continue to see politicians at all level. There's always going to be the ones who have the charisma and the ability to kind of um, embrace that populist fervor. In a funny way, there's actually some similarity, I think, between Rob Ford and between Justin Trudeau, because both of them do seem to have that incredible comfort at just sort of throwing themselves into a crowd of people and getting along with them and not sort of uh, not having the sort of the more stiff and uncomfortable um, uncomfortable approach to other people that we have seen in a lot of politicians. That kind of broke the mold, and I think that's probably going to continue. It's not something every politician could do, nor should they try. I mean, uh, some just are better at doing this sort of more formal statesman-like thing. Others can, can jump into the mon and do a selfie with the crowd. And I think that both Rob Ford and Justin Trudeau were of that latter element. Uh, and that sort of populism, it's always going to rise up. It's, it's a cyclical thing. There's going to be, there's always a need for it when it isn't there. And there will be a politician that will come along and, and want to fill it. And that's true at all levels. Mm -hmm. And people here in Toronto are still thinking of him uh, as his funeral will be held uh, in a couple of days. Ladies, thank you both so much for joining us today. That's all the time we have. Freelance journalist Susan Riley on the left of your screen there and the Ottawa Citizens Katie O'Malley.